Good morning and welcome to Greece Public Library's book break for February 3rd. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here at Greece Public Library. I moderate the Pints and Prose book discussion group and I am here as always with my colleague Claire. Hi everyone. I'm Claire. I do the historical fiction on Facebook and also are as the page turns book club. So mm -hmm. Excellent. And today, uh, the weather outside is frightful. So we thought we would bring you some of our favorite winter reads. So we both have warm drinks in our Greece mm -hmm. library mugs. Yay. Um, so these are books um, like curl up with a cup of tea or hot cocoa and a blanket if you've got a fireplace, maybe light a fire and curl up with one of these books. So Claire, do you want to start? Oh, sure. So I'm going to start with one called Bear Town. Um, and you can see by the cover that it's a nice wintry hockey scene. It's by Frederick Bachman, who wrote A Man Called Uva. Uva. Ulf, Uva. Yeah. Um, so this book is a little bit different. Well, it's kind of a lot different than, than that kind of like feel good, older, cantankerous man story. Um, Bear Town is a town in Sweden that is really kind of dying and they are totally living vicariously through their junior hockey team. Um, the success of this team could mean a new training, a national training center. Um, and with that, it could mean a revitalized economy. And plus the fact, it's just a lot of pride in the town and a love of hockey in general. Um, so a, a former star of Bear Town, who actually made it to the pros, made it out, is coming back to be the head coach of this junior hockey team with his family. And um, for once in their lives, they, they have a star player um, who a lot revolves around him. It's given the whole town hope um, that they have this guy that can score. The whole team is doing really well. And for once in their life, they have a chance, you know, a shot at the, the national junior championship. Um, what happens is there's a party beforehand and the daughter of the coach is raped by said star player. Um, and the rest of the book really goes into showing you how the town can be fractured by an event like this mm -hmm. and that people live vicariously a lot of times through their children and their athletic events, which um, I find to be very true and telling if you've ever had kids in sports. Um, so it, it's, it goes into what happens, like the, the coach and his family are shunned once the accusation comes to light. So the town is literally spit into, into factions, um, those that believe her and those that don't. So um, it, it's got a lot of great characters in it. One of them is a supporting hockey player on the team who has a secret of his own. And basically I have continued to read the series just to find out what happens to him alone. Um, so Bear Town is one of a planned trilogy uh, the second one is Us Against You, which we have here as well. The third one has not been published yet. And to that, I say, get on it, Frederick Bachman. <laughs> um, <laughs> before I forget all of these characters. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you like, you know, if you like hockey, this would be a great read. But even if you don't, it's, um, it would make a great book club read because mm -hmm. there's a lot of really meaty stuff in here. So nice. Yeah. Very cool. And you could check the box for first book in a series if you're participating in our Expand Your Reading Horizons Challenge. You sure could. There it is. <laughs> There's that sticker, first in series. Oh, I've got two of those today. Look Ooh, at me go. Excellent. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I haven't read any of his books, but I know people just love them. Like I didn't really popular. love Ove, Uva, yeah. whatever his okay. name is. Um, but this one I really liked a lot. So. Okay, nice. Um, so my three books, I've got um, a nonfiction and two fiction and they in kind of a sliding scale of uh, fact to fantasy. <laughs> so I think that's the way I'm gonna kind of present them. So my first book is Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. Um, this is a very stressful book. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's a nonfiction first person account of um, John Krakauer's attempted summiting of Mount Everest um, on May 10th of 1996. And 1996 was actually the deadliest climbing season in Everest history. Um, so just in Krakauer's group, five people died and one was extremely severely injured. Um, and there were multiple other groups on the mountain that day. So you get a whole look at kind of what it takes to climb Everest. Um, and I have to be very honest, I am not a person who like looks at a mountain and says, I need to climb that mountain. No, like I'm either. a hiker and I like being outside and seeing scenery and stuff, but I don't have that like drive to conquer that I feel like the people who climb Everest kind of seem to have. Um, so Krakauer is an experienced climber himself. He's a, a journalist and he's like, I'm going to climb Everest and write about it. Um, and he ends up in this group and he tells the whole story, not just of preparing to climb, but actually what it takes to climb the mountain and reaching the summit. Um, and all there are just so many things that went wrong um, and so many points where like each group has a guide, generally speaking, um, and the guides will like sit the group down before the day that they go for the summit and be like, okay, so here's what we're doing. And if this happens or this happens or this happens, we turn around, like, it doesn't matter. Um, if it gets to be this time, we turn around and that's like, this is our shot, but we might not actually make it. Um, and you just see like all of these checkpoints just get missed and missed and missed and like the disasters looming and then this huge snowstorm rolls in. So that was what really was the, the final um, disaster of that particular climb. Um, but it's terrifying and um, I have no interest in climbing Mount Everest ever. Um, but it was a fascinating look at what it takes to climb a mountain like that and um, like all of the pieces and parts that go along with it. And there's a fair amount of history thrown in of um, attempts to climb Everest and all of that. Um, yeah, so again, extremely stressful, um, but fascinating, fascinating, and it reads really fast. Um, so this would also be a good one if you are not um, a mountain climber or you don't know a lot about Everest, this would be a good one for nonfiction about a subject you don't know anything about. Um, I like Krakauer's writing. It's very clear um, and kind of unadorned and um, just a really interesting topic. I think I'm going to switch mine around since you said you're mm. going for your fantasy last. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this one kind of fits into what you said, although it's fiction. Um, it's called The Arctic Fury by Greer McAllister. Um, I just read this for the historical book mm. group. It is available as an ebook on Hoopla, and it would check two boxes in our challenge. It would be a historical fiction that is not World War II. Mm -hmm. because it happens like after like 1850s, okay. um, right after the Civil War. And it is also published by Source Books, which is an independent publisher. So nice. there, two boxes there. So the Arctic Fairy, the way I would describe it is an ensemble book because you have mm -hmm. this cast of characters. And that's one of the things we talked about last night is there's so many people to keep um, keep track of. And if you have the print book, there's this handy dandy uh, little list in the front. Oh if you boy. Don't, the author's website has a great like packet of information. Okay. Um, so these are the members. So you can see there's oh quite the, and then they give you a little map. Um, so anyway, Lady Jane Franklin, if you're not familiar, her husband was John Franklin and went on an Arctic expedition 1845 to look for the Northwest Passage and mm -hmm. um, didn't come back. So she sent, and this is true, no lone let, she sent seven expeditions out to look for her husband and his men. She's one of the primary reasons why we 
know so much about the Arctic because huh. there were so many explorations that went out. Um, so the, the premise of this book is she's fed up with the men that have not brought her husband back. So she has decided to hire a team of women because she feels like mm -hmm. she herself was an explorer that perhaps a team of women could get the job done. So she says. Um, so anyway, she, she finances this, but she wants complete anonymity. Um, she's going to deny it if it if it ever, you mm -hmm. know, if anything goes wrong. So she hires a, a young woman who was a guide to the West, um, taking people across through California and um, who had a very bad event in her life that she mentions and you find out at the end of the book. But anyway, um, she also gives her a list of eight women that have to go and then she's allowed to choose for herself. Um, so you have like a, a botanist, you have a newspaper person, and you have um, Caprice Collins, who I felt was one of the more interesting characters. She is a mountain climber socialite. Um, she kind of is portrayed very badly in the beginning, um, but she plays a pretty crucial part later on in the book. So um, the problem is, is Caprice does not make it back alive and her parents then um, charge Virginia with murder. So mm. you have two parts of this book and it goes in alternating chapters with a court case for murder in Boston mm. in 1853 or whatever it is and the actual expedition. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it was an interesting read. I'd say the first part kind of started a little slow for me and you, and you have to have that element of just, you know, you have to be able to suspend belief mm -hmm. to even you know, because I'm, I'm reading about, um, oh, we're going to get to wear our split skirts. And I'm thinking, you think that's going to keep you warm where you're going? <laughs> the other thing is when I saw the map, being the, the person that loves nature, I was like, hmm. okay, where are the polar bears? Because there are a lot of polar bears where she is, but never mentioned. So we don't, we don't have any polar bear terrors, but um, there are like sea captains and, you know, mishaps on the boat to even get mm -hmm. there and the party. So it's lots of adventure and drama. And, you know, it's a fun read to sit by the fireplace and mm -hmm. curl up and kind of envision yourself taking the Arctic while you're sipping your cocoa. Nice. I love a good exploration book. So I think I'm going to have to add that one to my list, my yeah. ever growing list. Yeah. So thank you, Claire. <laughs> Um, my second book is The Snow Child by Eowyn Ivy. Um, this was actually an all Rochester Reads book. Um, I'm not sure exactly what year. Um, she was the first author that we had here at Greece, okay. incidentally. Yeah. And I am so sad that I did not know about that and that I was not here. Um, but we read this book for Pints and Prose um, a couple of years ago. And it is one of the books that the group liked most, I think, of all of the books that we've read. Um, so The Snow Child is sort of loosely based on the fairy tale of The Snow Child, which is there's a, a childless couple um, and they build a child out of snow and the child comes to life is like the basics of the story, right? So in this one, we're set in the 1920s in Alaska um, John or Jack and Mabel are the childless couple. They have kind of moved to Alaska to maybe start again or maybe kind of run away. Um, it's clear they're having kind of a rough patch in their marriage. Um, like things are kind of bleak at the beginning of the book. Um, so they're in Alaska, they're attempting to homestead. Um, not going particularly well um and the first snow comes and in kind of a moment of levity they build a snowman and they build it like a snow child for themselves um and the next morning the snow child is gone but there are footprints running away from it and after that they start to see a little girl who um kind of skitters around the edge of the forest and gradually um, comes into their lives. Her name is Faina. 
Um, she lives somewhere off in the wilderness. Um, she hunts with a little red fox um, and she, you know, brings them presents of game and things like that um, and brings kind of joy to this childless couple's life. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the meat of the story, which is sort of their life with Faina as she grows up, because um, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it. Um, but it's a lovely, lovely book. Um, the depictions of Alaska are, I mean, just beautiful and terrifying. This is somehow now a theme of my books. It's beautiful and terrifying. Um, but you get a real sense for how hard a life homesteading in Alaska would have been in the 1920s. Um, again, it takes a like a real particular kind of character, I think, to think that that's the way you want to live. Um, but it's beautiful and they kind of explore this relationship between this kind of wild child who is maybe real and maybe mystical and maybe just a figment of everyone's imagination. Um, and I loved it. It's just a really um, heartwarming book. I love that one too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and lots to discuss there too. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Yeah. All right, so kind of going into the fairy tale realm, I'm mm -hmm. going to talk about my next one. Um, also kind of a Russian based. Um, mm -hmm. It's called The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. Um, this one is also a first in series. Mm. Do we have a fairy tale retelling in there? I think we do. I think we do. Yeah, so it might even fit into that. But. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great read for a cold, snowy night, um, especially if you love fairy tales. Mm -hmm. It's set in the 14th century. Okay, my, my ears are tiny. Uh, <laughs> and I'm having trouble keeping my things in here. Um, Gonna have you know, to get it, you a pair of the big over ear ones. Yeah, yeah, pretty soon. That's gonna be my only solution. Um, but it's in the north in a land called Rus, which we would now call Russia. Uh, a woman named Marina bears a daughter named Vyasa who she claims will have special powers. Um, mm -hmm. So unfortunately, Marina dies shortly thereafter and um, the child is left to be raised with her father and a nurse. Um, so from the get-go, she starts talking to the kitchen spirits and she roams the woods without fear. Um, you learn that her, the fairy tales that are told by the nurse are not just tall tales, but have an element of truth, mm -hmm. especially for Bayasa. Basta, I, I'm, I'm probably botching this. Um, <laughs> so the story starts to get really good when the father decides to remarry. And of course the stepmother doesn't care for Vyasa and her, her ways. And she brings a, a young obstinate priest to the village who is determined to wipe out the old ways and to bring the people to mm -hmm. God. Um, so while he's trying to do this, of course, he unleashes forces um, that Vyasa's magic is, is needed for. Um, so, but despite the prejudice of the people, you know, thinking that she's a witch, uh, she remains true to herself. She wants to save her village. Um, she can see spirits, uh, creatures, you know, in the lakes and, and whatever. So it's, it's kind of fun that way, if you like that kind of magical realism. Um, but let's see. And this one is also the start of a trilogy. Now I haven't read the hmm. other ones in the trilogy. I need to do that. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's a perfect winter read just because, nice. you know, when you think of sitting in the, in the snow, what comes to mind, but a nice fairy tale on a witch. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so my last one is, um, fairy tale fantasy also. So mine is Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. Um, I think it's kind of an even split. Some libraries have this one in young adult, some have it in adult. Um, I think it could go either way. Um, but so it's not necessarily a retelling of a particular fairy tale, but it is a fairy tale 
itself, really. Um, so there are three point of view characters in the book. There's Miriam, who is the daughter of a Jewish money lender. Um, we're also set in kind of a Russia-like country. It's never mm -hmm. really identified, but it's it's Russia, <laughs> some kind of Slavic place. Um, so Miriam is the daughter of a Jewish money lender. Um, her father is not particularly good at his money lending job. Uh, so Miriam starts to um, take up more and more of the slack for her father um, to try and provide for her family. So we have Miriam um, and she's the, the one who does the spinning of silver. So it's kind of a twist on the Rumpelstiltskin where she's not literally spinning silver into gold or straw into gold, um, but she is turning silver into gold through her skill at um, money lending and bargaining and um, business, essentially. Um, we have Wanda, who is a peasant girl. Um, her, she has a couple of younger brothers. Um, her mother is um, loving, but kind of under the thumb of her father, who is um, a drunk and not a very nice man. Um, her mother passes away fairly early in the book, and Wanda has to kind of take up the role of leading the household um, and earning money that her father then drinks away. Um, Irina is the daughter of the Duke, who is being um, sort of groomed for like a, an advantageous political marriage mm -hmm. um, and ends up getting married off to none other than the Tsar himself. Um, so there are so there are these three stories, um, alternating points of view, and they start to gradually converge as the story continues. Um, so that was really fun was seeing, you kind of got the feeling that these three were all gonna come together, um, but it was difficult to tell how from the beginning. So that was, that was, um, that was fun. And then there are also some, you know, just magical, parts of the story, there's witches, there's like snow magic, and there are, um, I guess we would call them, I don't remember what they call them in the book, but they're essentially like elves or fairies, like a, a snow people who live in like another, another land. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they have influence over um, the real, the real world. Um, so we have like encroaching winter and, you know, it's not thawing the way it used to and it's hard to grow crops. So things are getting hungry and cold and cold and dark. Um, and it's up to these three different women in different places to figure out how to set kind of the whole thing right. So three strong female characters, um, really nicely developed. So there's no cardboard people here. Mm -hmm. um, and they all have their own sort of individual struggles. Um, and they're all kind of trying to find their own place in the world. Um, but it is, you know, snowy and dark and cold and magical and really perfect for curling up next to the fire with a nice warm drink and just reading late into the night. I think I read another one by her that was also mm -hmm. a fairy tale retelling, and I can't think of the name of it, but it was really good as well. Yeah, um, this is the first one of hers that I've read, and I would definitely read more of hers. Yeah. So can we put in a plug for our, our joint book club that's coming up next week? I don't know why we wouldn't. Um, we're doing The Nickel Boys by Colson mm -hmm. Whitehead, um, February 10th at 6.30. Yep. Um, register so you can get a link to Zoom. I started this book yesterday and I am already three quarters of the way in. It is a small book, very powerful book and mm -hmm. um, perfect for the, you know, Black History Month. A lot to yes. talk about. So join us if you can. Absolutely. It's next Wednesday. Um, as Claire said, at 630, the registration is on our online calendar or you can call us and we can register you over the phone but that's how you get a link to the zoom um we still so we're have doing, plenty of copies of books available so yes we do um we're doing this as a a special joint 
meeting of my book club as the page turn or no your book club as the page turns my book club is pints pros I'm losing my mind um but we're gonna meet together as a big group so it should be a lot of fun I'm really excited about it yeah me too um, and if you haven't registered for the Expand Your Reading Horizons Challenge, you can do that online as well through our website um, or here in the library and, you know, get yourself out of any sort of reading funk or ruts you might be in um, and join us. I'm loving it. I, I yeah, you know, having great fun checking those boxes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very satisfying. It is. Um, it is satisfying to check a box. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you read a book and then afterwards you're like, wait. It counts. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that a couple of times. Me too. <laughs> um, yes. So you can find all of that information right on our website. Um, join us. And in the comments, if you have a favorite sort of atmospheric winter read, um, please let us know. I love reading winter books like this. Um, I'm always Me looking too. for a new one. And if you've read any of the ones that we've talked about today, swing by and let us know what you thought or drop a comment here on Facebook and let us know what you thought. Yep, we love your comments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, um, so we will be back in two weeks. And until then, for Claire and myself at Greece Public Library, happy reading. Bye-bye.